think of them and let them know you've thought of them. It's such an easy thing to do. And it's such a great way to maintain relevance with your networks in a really genuine, authentic way. Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. I've always been fascinated by professionals that recover from career setbacks and achieve great things in their lives. Not just executives, but also athletes, artists, politicians. And I often wonder how they were able to turn things around. The effort that they must have put into place to take care of their mental health and ensuring they remain on course. And also the team around them the coaches, supporting them and providing them with the right advice. And this is why I invited my friend Sasha Kaufman to have a chat with me for this episode. The first time I heard Sasha speak at an event that I organized, but I have to admit, I didn't really check what he was going to talk about. It was a panel discussion. I was mesmerized and frankly, I was frozen just listening to him speak. You could hear a pin drop. Everybody was in absolute silence. We think that there was about 150 people in the room. And the repercussion of that conversation with Sasha at that event at Monash University just went on and on and on for months. We were still talking about what he had said, and I'm not going to anticipate what it was because we're going to address it at the episode. Sasha Kaufman is an executive with over 25 years of commercial experience. He's worked at some of the best global consulting firms in the world, always in learning and leadership development roles. Sasha embraced his entrepreneurial side uh, most recently and started two startups that have grown successfully. But Sasha's career was not without challenges. In his mid-twenties, he was fired from a top-tier consulting firm following some difficult personal circumstances, which impacted negatively on his behavior at work. His situation, which he will explain in our interview, made him feel lonely and it was difficult to talk about it with anyone, let alone open up about it at work. This in turn led to further troubles in both his work and personal life. But this story has a happy ending, of course, and this is why I really wanted to interview Sasha. Today, Sasha is an influential leadership and well-being coach, consultant and facilitator with a passion to help individuals, teams and organizations to be the best that they can be. He leads a life of purpose, follow his passions and is one of the most generous, humble and giving persons I know. In this episode of the Job Hunting Podcast, Sasha opens up about these challenges and shares how being authentically vulnerable saved his career and ultimately led him on his crusade to help others navigate obstacles in their lives. Look, it's a long episode, folks, so please grab a coffee or your tea or go for a long walk because it's 100% worth listening to. We start with Sasha explaining the link between listening and empathy. And we go on from there, moving slowly but surely from his narrative as an excellent leadership expert that he is, to him telling more and more about his personal journey. So here we go, diving straight into the deep end. Please enjoy. How do I really understand some of the challenges that someone with young kids has without me actually sitting and listening? So it's the first or the core thing about empathy is that ability to listen and to try and see and understand the perspective of the other person. That's key to empathy. And empathy being such a big strength and muscle that you're trying to build as part of your leadership coaching that you do, is it one of your top strengths, Sasha? What are your top strengths? I always ask this to, you know, all of my podcast guests, but I think in this episode more than ever, I'm really curious to know what do you believe um, or, or have you tested it using like the via strengths yeah, test? Yeah, well, look, em- empathy is definitely one of my key strengths. And I know that through both my work and personal lives as well, you know, so I guess I'm described often as the, the friend that people would go to when they have an issue, they have a challenge, there's something they're trying to work through that is typically quite 
quite vulnerable. Uh, you know, they would they would seek me out and kind of say, I know that you'll be able to help me through that. Now, that doesn't mean that I can help them solve their problem. What it really means is back to what I said before, that I will give them my time and I will listen. I'm giving them that opportunity just to vent and to tell their story for, for me to sit and listen. That sometimes is just so critically important. So absolutely, that is a strength and it's something that I've used in my career, but but I do personally as well. Some of my other main strengths is I'm a people connector. So when I build relationships with people, I really try to, to gauge a good breadth of you know what's important to them, what's relevant for them outside of what I can just provide so that I can bring people and connect them with people outside of my own skill set. And there'd be various conversations that I'm having with people where it'll trigger, okay, so based on what you've just told me, I think you should connect with this person because there'll be some value for you to have. So connecting has been a, a big part of my career to date and something that I love to do and I would definitely describe as a as a key strength. And so similar to the connecting is is building relationships. So okay. I've had relationships, you know, over the years, you and I are a classic example. We don't need to talk every day, but the fact that, you know, we can reach out, reconnect with each other almost at any point in time, see a piece of content that, that we know might be relevant or interesting for each other. I build lasting relationships with people and that has helped me in my career navigate some of the more challenging times and also helped me in terms of, you know, the decisions, you know, knowing who to go to, having that sounding board, good people that I trust who have a vested interest, love and a care for me and would, would equally look out for me in the same way that I would do so for them. So this, this mutual caring network I would describe it as. I love that. And and as an example for the listeners, if they if this is too theoretical for them, it really warms my heart when it's like a Sunday afternoon and I get a text from you because mm. you've listened to something or you're watching something or you're reading something and you thought of me and you send it. Mm. And it's just so nice. You know, mm. it, it would mm. have been, I don't know, weeks or months since we've last spoken, but Yep. That something, you know, yeah, there's made something you there think that... of me and then mm. you sent it to me and you said, you have to watch this, you have to read this, you're going to love it. And I, it really is something nice that you can do for somebody that is part of your network. It doesn't matter how long ago you've seen them. If you thought of them, reach out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the thing, you know, there's nothing else. There's no sort of ulterior motive. It's just something that's so pure and authentic that I listened to a podcast and I went, Oh, Renata would love this, or you know, James would 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 really appreciate this piece of content or something because I know that that's of value to them. And if I've listened to it, or well, I'm not just going to assume that you know you've got your hands on it. So think of them and let them know you've thought of them, and send them a little message and say, "Hey, I thought of you. Listen to this podcast. I think you'd really love it." Or I, you know, watched this video on YouTube and and reminded me of some of the things you and I talked about. It's such an easy thing to do, and it's such a great way to maintain relevance with your networks in a really genuine, authentic way. You mm. mentioned before the need to build empathy to reinforce loyalty. And mm. with the re great resignation and people leaving the jobs, voting with their feet, there's the lack of loyalty, which I'm assuming you believe it's to do with the lack of empathy from employers to their employees. I mean, you've been talking to people, you've been coaching, you've been uh, consulting. How are employers looking at this issue of the great resignation and the exit of their staff? It's, it's very hard to lump all employers into one box and the same thing with, you know, all workers or employees, you know. Sure. Um, every employer is different. Um, there are differences across industries. There are differences across, you know, sizes of organizations within industry, just like there are differences in, you know, focus, passion, attention for, for lots of workers. So, you know, there are no doubt that there are lots of employers that are doing this well and who have absolutely absolutely recognized that, as I said earlier, that this is the year of the employee, that employee well-being and value is absolutely at the, at the forefront to maintain that loyalty. So there are those that are doing it well. They're putting things in place. They're putting well-being in place. They've adopted hybrid working models. They've adopted flexible working models that are not only now short-term, but are really here to stay. You know, some of the big four uh, consulting firms, for example, were very proactive in announcing that, 
hey, hybrid working is here to stay. You no longer need to be here in the office. We're focused much more on outcomes. How you get the work done is far less important than the outcomes that we are striving for. So if that means that you need to work more, you know, late because you've got kids to drop off in the morning or you literally just want to spend more time sleeping in because you're not really a morning person, we're much more focused on let's get the work done well and on time, but the manner and, and the time in which you do it and where you do it from is is far less important. So there are those companies that are definitely doing it well. There are still some companies that aren't. There are still some companies that, for whatever reason, kind of think that it's a one size all and that you know the, the whole COVID thing was a short-term thing and the only way to really manage work effectively is to revert back to the, the normal system of, hey, there are fixed hours and you come into the office and this is work time and work time is separate to, to home time. And then there are certain jobs and careers where flexible working arrangements and, you know, the ability to work from anywhere simply don't exist. You know, if you work in construction and you are actually building houses or hotels or hospitals or car parks or whatever, that really is not a thing for you. So, What I'm also hearing is that there are some frustrations. For example, if we do take construction to to present this example, there are the white collar workers in construction or those that work in the office, you know, the project managers and the salespeople, et cetera, who then get the luxury of working flexibly and working from anywhere. The guys and the girls who are on site literally have to be on site. So in some industries that it's causing this kind of divide, well, If these guys are getting these perks, what perks can we get? And that's something that I think is still an unresolvable issue. And there are some, you know, several other industries that are that are similar to that. Long answer to your question, some organizations are doing it really well and proactively and seeing it as a long-term sustainable thing. Definitely measuring productivity and focusing on productivity rather than input. Others aren't. And then others are kind of in this difficult situation of, hey, you know, we don't have that luxury. It's a very interesting conundrum because up until 2019, so many organizations, those avant-garde organizations that we look up to in terms of, you know, how they treat their employees and whatnot, Mm. were investing so much in their campus, Mm. in their office location with Mm. all the perks being oh you come to work and we have food for you we have massage for you we have a you know a a nap room we have a meditation room we have so it Mm. was really enticing for them to bring stuff together and these same organizations are now saying Mm. stay home and you don't have to come back to work ever again so you know they flipped and they are nimble enough to be able to flip whereas what you're saying is some organizations either are not nimble enough, they have too much of a bureaucracy of policies Mm. and protocols that doesn't enable them to adopt those sort of different cultures very quickly. And Mm. others structurally just can't. It's just really hard, you know, health sector, tourism, hospitality, infrastructure, transport, constructions, and so on. So it's a a decade-long transition, not Mm. only because we need to establish what we can and cannot do from home, but also insurance-wise and, you know, mm. patient health and safety and yeah. globalization. Can you work from a different country? And, you know, how do you tax people differently or mm. organizations differently if they have stuff? It's just big Pandora box that we have opened and it will be a while till we sort it out. But yeah, that tyranny of distance of leaders leading from, from a distance, right? Mm not being able to watch what people are doing and observe. There's a tendency to micromanage. There's a tendency to not sometimes not be authentic. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in in, in my space in leadership development, you know, leadership hasn't changed in the way that I I see leadership and, you know, the skills that are so vital to leadership. So the the what in leadership hasn't, hasn't necessarily changed. What has changed is the how we lead because Mm. we now live in this technological world, hybrid learning, people working from remote locations and not under our nose, et cetera, you know, we still need to, to, to lead, to coach, to inspire, to empower, to trust. We still need to do that. But the way in which we do it has differed through the use of technology and remote learning. So, you know, the fundamentals are still there, but really the, the how do we do that, you know, so how do we check in with our employees? How do we check in and make sure that they're okay? How do we check in and 
and make sure that they're contributing? How do we make sure that they check in and feel valued? How do we make sure that their voices are heard and, you know, in terms of decision making when they're not physically sitting here in the room? So that's something that is kind of a big focus of the work that I'm doing with leaders is, again, not saying that those things were never important. They were always important. But how do you do that now in this remote situation when, you know, people aren't physically sitting in the room? That's very different. And this leads to sort of the, the really key questions that I would love to to talk to you about, because we've never been so open about our personal lives. I mean, you can see my background. I can see your background. We're at home. Sometimes there are noises. Sometimes there are people. We are literally weaving in the personal sphere with the professional sphere every time we log in for a Zoom meeting. Mm. It's just completely changed the way that we engage with our work. So, so, so different from from two, three years ago. And that leaves us, you know, vulnerable and much more open for our colleagues and peers at work to find out about what's happening at home. And you are such a great person to talk about this because you were ahead of your time in terms of sharing your vulnerabilities and mm. your challenges while mm -hmm. you were building your corporate career and having huge, massive issues to deal with at mm -hmm. home. I wouldn't be bringing it up if I knew you, you, you know, you're comfortable talking about this. I know this is part yeah, of, your, of your speaking blurb and the sort of stuff that you talk about when you're training mm. your leaders. So why don't we tell the listeners a little bit about your background yeah, sure. And how um, you how you developed your corporate career and the ups and downs yeah. around that. Well, ab absolutely. You know, you and I, you and I have talked about this over the years, and it's and it's an absolutely core part of my story are the challenges and the vulnerabilities that I experienced, particularly early on in my career. So there's there's no shying away from it. And you know, if anything, I now looking back, I um, really love to talk about it because it absolutely directed me in the right way, having to go through some of the, the learnings and the challenges through my, my poor behaviors uh, early on in my career. So I guess my story, the way that I tell my story is I was a bit of a, a high achiever slash nerd at school, um, always did really, really well um, at school and you know had a choice of university courses, ended up at Monash University in Melbourne and I did arts commerce. And again, I did really well at university, um, excelled on both commerce and, and I did psychology for arts, choice of honors, and I ended up doing my honors in econometrics and finance. But really, that was a year of procrastination to go. I'm not ready to go out into the world. I don't know what there is there yet. And management consulting was this big buzz back then. And I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. You know, working with some leading firms on some amazing projects across multiple different industries, you know, the diversity and the breadth and the team dynamics all sounded very exciting. And back then, it was the big six firms. Um, now, of course, it's the big four. And I remember I was fortunate to receive offers from five out of the big six. And it was like amazing. And I ended up joining Arthur Anderson. But at the time that I joined Arthur Anderson to start off my, my career after university was almost to the same day, my mum was diagnosed with a terminal lung cancer. And I lived with my mum. I'm the elder of two siblings from my dad's first marriage. My mum and dad were divorced. My mum was a single mum and she was a working class mum. She was actually a psychiatric nurse. So her getting sick meant some some real trouble. She was not going to be able to work. She was not going to be able to care for herself. And I'm in my mid-20s, kind of at the prime of my career, ready to go. And everything sort of came crashing down. You know, I had to look after my mum. But for some reason, like there was this there was kind of this shame in that, you know, I'm so young, my mum's so young, she's ill. And that was a hard thing to talk about. And I, and I didn't talk about it with a lot of people. A lot of colleagues at work didn't really know about it. It wasn't something that I, I, I shared early on. You're not um, that old, but there was a time when people didn't talk about these things at work. Yeah, Plus yeah. It but, but didn't it's, occur but to us to I mean, talk about it either. It's just, it's just when I talk about it now and I say, shame, like, how could I be shameful of my mum falling ill and, and, and being embarrassed to talk about it and, and so forth? And I guess what happened was, you know, I went from being child, although I was in my mid-20s, I went from child to kid 
carer. And and I think that was the thing for me that was probably the embarrassing thing that I had to look after my mother um, emotionally and financially. And and I and I really didn't share that or talk about that with a lot of people. Um, now that meant for me that not having an outlet, not not being able to vent and share and being vulnerable back then meant that behaviorally I was changing at work. In fact, I was becoming a real rat bag. I was doing all sorts of pesty, nuisance, annoying things. I was sending inappropriate emails. I was misbehaving. I was rebelling. And it was very, very unlike me. As I said, I'd been a bit of a, a, a goody two-shoes at, at school. And I kind of knew that if I wasn't going to make a change myself, and I was about two years in, I was going to be kicked out. There was no doubt. I'd had you know that many warnings from HR and all sorts of things. And fortunately, at the time, I'd been tapped on the shoulder by one of the strategy consulting firms. And I went, you know what? This is a great outlet. And I'll, I'll mention the firm. It was A.T. Carney. Now, they are a top tier strategy global consulting firm. And you know, if you wanted to work in consulting, you would love to work for one of them. And I ended up getting the job with them. And I think I lasted about a year. And, and there, I broke every kind of moral and ethical rule that you could possibly do. I, I'm not I'm not casual about that as as I sound, but for me, it was just the workplace was somewhere that was I needed for a paycheck. I needed to be able to, to financially support my mother. And because of the emotional burden that I guess it was having on me and looking after it, I just rebelled and I did you were all venting. sorts of it's I was almost venting. like you were venting at work. I was I was absolutely venting. I was breaking. I was breaking rules around um, expense policy. I was flying business class to to things that when I should have uh, been in economy. I was staying in hotels over weekends when I should have been coming home, but it was just easier rather than having to recheck in, etc. I was looking for all these, I guess, creature comforts in my working life, materialistic things that made my life easier because at home, my life was crumbling and it was incredibly challenging. And please note, listeners, I'm not using this as an excuse for my behavior. I got fired. I deserved to be fired. It was completely on me and it was a huge lesson. What this is, is the explanation. And the explanation has only come through years of you know therapy and counseling afterwards as to well, why did I act out in this way? Because at the time, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing. But not having that network, not having the vent, the workplace became that vent. Mm-hmm. So I lost my job at AT Kearney. That was devastating. I told my dad, who I'm not close to or wasn't close to at the time, and my then girlfriend, and they were the only two people. But to everyone else... I created a different narrative and I and that narrative became almost the truth for me that and that was hey I was I was traveling too much for work it was getting too much I needed to be home more mum's re- recently fallen ill I need to be around her so I I made the choice so effectively a huge big lie which I thought was going to shield me and it did anything but it just mm-hmm. it just uh, you know it was this false armor and I, I was never vulnerable in that process but at that time, I was very fortunate to find the Reach Foundation run by the, the, the late, great Jim Steins, former AFL footballer slash youth ambassador, inspirational leader. And Jim ran this organization that was to empower teenagers to sort of find their self-esteem, build empathy, show vulnerability, etc. And I was supposedly there as a leader. My friend, Ben Gelbart, was a doctor. He'd been there as a leader and he was leaving to travel the world for a year. And he said, Sasha, why don't you come in? You'd be great. Now, I went there going, oh, yep, I can, I can show these teenagers a good thing. Well, let me tell you, I became the student. And what I saw in these young people going through incredibly troubled lives in whatever aspect it was, going through divorce, going through bullying, some of them going through physical or emotional violence and talking about it and sharing that with a network was such a huge eye opener to me. And that was where I went, oh my God, look at the power in sharing, being open, talking about um, your challenges. Through that process, uh, I met a great lady, Sue Bannatine. She was a partner at PwC. And she said, Sasha, we've actually got a role that I think you'd be perfect for. It's in coaching our young graduates at the firm. I think you'd be amazing. I'd love to champion you in. So I went went for the role, got the role. I was in the role about a year and a half. And still today, I say it was one of the best roles and the best environments that I'd ever worked in. 
I just loved it. I loved the people. I loved what I was. Um, it was facilitating. It was consulting. It was presenting. It was working to Im- inspire these young, enthusiastic graduates and help shape them early on in their careers. And I loved it. That's when but we my, met. But my, that's when we met. Correct. Yeah. But my world came crashing down again. And it was about 2006 or 2007, uh, the head of HR called me when I was in Sydney one day. She called me into her office and she said, Sasha, did you ever work at AT Carney? And I mm-hmm. think I felt the blood rush from my face to my feet. I must have just gone absolutely white. And I was like, oh my God, yes, because this was now four years on. Yes. And she said, were you fired? And I said, yes. And I kind of went through this whole story again. And she said, okay, well, someone brought that to our, to our attention. We looked on your CV and AT Carney was left out of your CV. So effectively, uh, you know, they saw it as I'd manipulated my way or I'd been dishonest in providing the information to then get me in the door and get me the job at PwC. Mm-hmm. So this was like the second time I'm being fired for sort of roughly the same incident, only this time I had partners, HR managers, you know, graduates all coming to to rally around me and support me and say, hey, you know, he is amazing and what he's done here is great and so forth. You know, behaviorally, I was in such a different place. The big difference for me was, so I ended up losing my job. It took them about five days to make the decision. And they went with the real hard line of, despite the fact, you know, you've been a a rating one performer and everything you've done here has been so, so brilliant. We really have to take the hard line and say, you know, you were dishonest in, in how you came to us and the information you provided. And that was a bitter pill to swallow. It was devastating for me. But the difference was now, my mum was no longer around, sadly. She was no longer my priority and the person whom I needed to protect. It was now about me. And so for the first time, and again, through reach and seeing the power of vulnerability, I was able to say, I'm not okay. I was able to put up my hand and say, I need help. I'm crashing here. I can't, I can't go through life like this. I, I, need, I need to change. And in doing that, it was the most liberating and empowering thing that I've ever done because industry networks and people around me, friends, family, etc., who didn't know really what I was going through because I had never been, been honest and forthcoming, suddenly came to me and said, I, I want to help. I want to help you. Let me help you. Let's get you out of this mess. You know, a huge, huge shout out to Mark Jankelson, who is one of the senior HR figures at ANZ Bank, who listened to my story and who said, Sasha, I love your story. I appreciate your honesty. We've got a role for you. I, I think it would be a great fit. And and from there, that's what sent me on my quest to go. I'm not the only one that goes through these challenges in life. But the biggest learning here, I want to share this with anyone and everyone that I come in into contact with. And that's really how I embarked on this, this pathway of wanting to work with people, understanding the importance and power of vulnerability, um, building empathy. Um, and as I said, it is the foundation for, for who I am and therefore what I, what I love to teach. So this is when I I met you. I met you when you were an A and Z, not Peter Abusi, okay. because because by then you had already had this awakening. Your mother mm-hmm. had already passed away. I'm I'm so sorry about that. I've said this to you before. Mm-hmm. She must have been yeah. an amazing woman. And our friend John Burgess, who was working with me, I was hiring him to help me with the Monash MBA work that mm-hmm. I was doing back then. He said, you have to bring Sasha to speak to mm-hmm. your students. Those yeah. were MBA students and master students. We had a, a, a breakfast for them every three weeks. I can't remember exactly, but we used to invite alumni and you were a mm-hmm. Monash alumni. So John said, invite Sasha. And I had no idea what you were going to talk about. Mm. And then here comes this very well-dressed, very well-groomed, looking incredibly successful young man at 8 a.m. in the morning telling 100 students how crappy his, you know, young years as a graduate and, Mm. you know, how he blew a couple of jobs. And that was so, so vulnerable Mm. at a time back in 2008, 2009, when that was still not in vogue. There was no Brené Brown back then. Mm. We There was 
no one else talking like that to anyone. That was so unusual and unique. And I think people were just blown away by by you back then, right? Yeah. And then you from know, that look- point onwards, wherever I went, I took you. <laughs> you yeah. were then with um, me at the chartered account. I, I, I remember I remember the session so incredibly well because whilst I might have looked calm and so forth, you know, it was one of the first times that I was still going to stand in front of a group and tell the story. You know, whilst I'd sat down and I talked, you know, in one-on-one or in very small intimate groups, standing up and presenting amongst other presenters as well and and making the conscious decision in advance to say, I'm going to talk about my shitty experience and how bad I was and all the wrongs that I did as, you know, the truth to my career and and how I am where I am today. I was shaking inside. So if I didn't show it externally, I certainly felt I I can still go back and feel it. But, But you're right. Look, the response that I got from I think there would have been probably more than 100 students in the room. I think there was there, there were 150 odd students waiting one on one to sort of line up and talk to me. And, you know, a couple of them kind of wanted to even just instantly relay the challenges that they were facing at the time. And um, they felt the comfort to do so. And and again, even just that response kind of went, wow, look at look at the difference that you can make. We all go through challenges. We are all incredibly imperfect species. We are all imperfect. It's about you know, to use Ben Crow, who is an absolute mentor of mine, his words, and and he he utters them much more articulately than me. But as imperfect species, it is about embracing our imperfections, learning to accept what they are, that we are going to make mistakes and we're all going to trip up and, and there are tolerances and limits to what we can achieve, but being okay and accepting that. And that's where I think I got to where I don't know that I could have done anything differently. I didn't know what it was like to be a full-time carer at 25 years of age. I didn't know the impact that it was going to have on me. And then not being able to share share that load with, with other people. None of my friends at the same age were, going, were losing a parent, so they couldn't really empathize with me. Absolutely, I told them more and more and they could see, you know, my mum's demise and they could sympathize, but they couldn't empathize. Yeah. So I still felt very alone and I, and I still feel that I don't know that I would have been able to do anything differently back then. Now I tell people, you know, you, you've got to share and you've got to, you've got to open up and you've got to talk about it. People have an inherent want to help when there is an authentic vulnerability present. Um, I think for learned. people listening and, you know, I see this a lot with my clients and people that ask me questions on social media, you know, how do I explain that I have been without work for two years? Mm. And I often say, tell them the truth. <laughs> Don't mm. try to make something up or Renata, I can't get a job, but also I've been caring for my mom. I mean, so many people during this COVID yeah. times became carers, you know, they yeah. had to self-isolate because they, their parents were not people that could get COVID and had to, you know, be very cautious or they, they had children that had some autoimmune disease and they couldn't work. And, mm. and people feel like they can't share that with mm. recruiters. And I am all for you sharing that with Absolutely. recruiters. Because it's not really about even being imperfect. It's just being human. There's yep. more to life than work. Yep. If you couldn't work, that's fine. Well, yep. we are in a privileged country here where if you can't work, you're not, you know, th- there are there is a safety net around you of mm. Centrelink and mm. and government support. So, you know, this broadcast, mm. this podcast goes uh, worldwide. So uh, not every country where it mm. reaches has this amazing support that we have here. I mean, people don't think it's amazing, but you have to understand I'm from Brazil. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in comparison, we do have quite a good welfare system here. Yep. But we have to make the most out of it. I remember during COVID, Sasha, some people were calling me and saying, look, I really need Need your help. I really need your support. I haven't, I haven't accessed Centrelink yet, and I'm like, mm. why not? What are you waiting for? You mm. know, if you need the support, just reach out. People are so ashamed 
Yeah, yeah, and, and I and yeah. I and that's what I re- that's what I can relate to. I mm. I I relate to that shame. So in the story that I told of you know having to be carer at twenty five of my mother, none of my friends had to care for my for, for for their parent. You know, so it was it was shameful. I, I look back now and I go, what was wrong with me? How is that shameful? The support that I could have had, the encouragement. The, the shoulders, it's just, it's it's astounding. But I just, I want to touch on two things that you said just, just, just briefly while I remember. So one is you said, you tell your listeners to tell the truth. I absolutely 100% endorse that all the time. Tell the truth. You must tell the truth. What is your narrative? And tell it, tell it in a meaningful way. If you've had issues, challenges, etc. And clearly I have, what did you learn from them? What's been your learning? Now, obviously I, I talked about how it opened up for me. Uh, I was able to be vulnerable. So that in itself drew people around me. And then it created this gift and this want to instill this skill and and, and way of thinking in everyone uh, who, I, who I meet, right? So it sent me on this positive journey. But but what was the learning for you during your challenging time? That's that's what you should be focused on, rather than what the issue was that that um, that you may have done or your dark past, if you had one. And the other thing that you, you touched on briefly was, you know, not necessarily being imperfect, but being human. For me, being human is being imperfect. There is no such thing as perfection. In that's my right. view, we all have cracks and crevices in in different in different areas or in different times of our lives. That is normal. How we how we how we cope and how we deal with them is what's what's criti- is what's critically important. Um, and again, that's why you know lots of leadership skills and learning and 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 courses and things like this. You know, your podcast provides such good mechanisms to kind of go, hey. You're not on your own here. Believe me when I say everyone has had some kind of issue, challenge, difficult time or times in their lives that they've had to navigate that might look like stains in their career, but really there was something going on. Feel free and be brave and courageous to share what was going on for you. You know, whether you had to be a carer for someone who was ill or you just, you know, you you just literally lost motivation and you were you were having doubts about, you know, life and, and living. We all we all have these moments and no more time than now is it safe and okay to recognize and talk about our challenges, but hopefully mm. what we've learned from them and how we can move forward more positively. We can't do it on our own. We all need people. We all need to connect. Um, and connectedness is is critically important. And it actually reminds me, Renata, if I may, just going back to uh, the strengths that we talked about earlier on. Two other strengths that I think are incredibly connected together are time. I love to be generous with my time where I can be. So when people reach out, people are referred or they reach out cold. So long as I I get a sense of what is it that they're asking for, and that's clear and overt, then I'll try and be generous with my time. And the the most amazing people I've learned along the way are people who've reached out to me. And that goes hand in hand then with curiosity. Mm. Curiosity. It is such an important thing from a career point of view, whereas if you're closed-minded to something that you perhaps don't even know about or you think you're not even interested in, but you haven't even given it a go, you're potentially missing some incredible opportunities. So my two strengths that I like to focus on and, and two things that I would absolutely tell your listeners to do is be curious and be generous with your time. People mm. who reach out to you, if you can, accommodate them. By all means, ask what they're after. Try and know what their intentions are. But if you can, if you can fit them in, um, meet with them. Because in the great words of John Burgess, who matters? Everybody yeah. matters. Yes. And you just don't know who you're going to come across. And I have met some incredibly inspiring people that I never would have met with if I wasn't curious uh, or, or that I just simply said no to. 
And for those listening, John Burgess is a, a, a common friend of ours and a very well-known executive coach here in Melbourne who won't come on this podcast. <laughs> I've invited him several times. That's a real shame. And it's not that he doesn't want to come because we're we, John is one of my oldest friends here in Australia, but he wants me to invite other people. He's like, I'm not coming, but you have to invite such and such people and such and such mm. people. So he, he goes, he's such a great connector and he wants the soapbox to, to be given to someone else, which I think yep. is such a lovely thing to do so maybe one day i'll convince him john if you're listening uh you know you're still on my on my list one thing that i i like to discuss with you as well and i want to know how how you you've done this is even though you say when i invited you to speak at that monash alumni event was that the first time you spoke publicly about what was going on because you sounded really confident and and <laughs> here is what i want to say it's important to tell the truth and it's important to tell your story uh, as it is yeah. anticipate any white elephants in the room for example f from that conversation story you told about pwc you know you shouldn't um, keep things because they will come to bite you mm. but it's also really important to come to terms with it before you step up and tell your mm. truth you mm. know if there is a grieving process that needs to happen if there is some resolution that you need to uh, or reflections that you need to do and you mentioned narrative you know if you have to mm. work on your narrative it's important to do that before you yeah. go and talk to let's say a recruiter or a future employer or a, yeah. you know an important person in your network because Those are not opportunities for you to go through therapy with them. Mm. You know, I think that needs to happen prior. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a different conversation. So I wanted to ask you, how did you prepare yourself for that public speaking? Because it was so impressive and it impressed so many people. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, so I think, so I, as I said earlier, I, that was the first time that I had shared the story in a big group um, presentation. I had not done that before that day and also alongside other guest speakers. I, you know, I was, I was one of a few guest speakers that day and I can't remember the topic, but it was something about, you know, networking or, or, or you know, how to get a job or how to be, you know, start your career successfully. And I was Sasha, like, oh I God. don't remember the other guest speakers at all. I just remember no. you. And oh, we... Well, <laughs> 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 and we used to invite a lot of fancy people yeah, on yeah. stage, um, as you know, but I can't um, remember any of them. <laughs> and look, so, so, so I made the conscious decision that if I was going to come and present that I was not going to stand up there and bullshit. I had a story to tell. And thankfully now I had told that story time and time and time again albeit in much more intimate one-on-one -on -one sessions, sitting down with friends or friends' parents or, you know, um, former work colleagues or my networks, you know, I had done it. And each time I did it, got easier and easier, you know, people were, were, were willing to listen. Um, I got all sorts of different reactions. You know, some people were incredibly empathetic and, 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 and incredibly supportive. Some people, you know, still sort of took a, a pretty hard line and went, well, look, you know, those actions, they're going to stick with you for a long time and you know people have long memories and you know it, it wasn't it wasn't all you know hey everyone just wrap their wrap me up in cotton wool by any means um i had multiple different uh different reactions but what was important was that it was my story and it was the truth so going as i said going to that session whatever the topic was i was like well, i got to tell the truth here and i was i was crapping myself inside thankfully maybe i'd done a lot of presenting and a lot of public speaking, it, it might not have shown, but I was shaking inside looking to a group of probably 150 master's students all looking at me for inspiration on how to succeed in their careers when I had, I had failed miserably twice. So yeah, long answer to your question. I was, I knew what I was, I knew I was going to say it. I didn't know how it was going to come out. Well, you made an, an amazing impact and you still do. And after that, you may not remember this, but I invited you to speak a couple of more times. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I've enjoyed all your speaking yes, engagements. That's because I am really fascinated by how people understand success and failure mm. and how misunderstood 
understanding people are about their career trajectories. And, and mm. you know, sometimes you're super successful and you still feel like shit. Mm. And sometimes you fail miserably. And that is such a huge awakening. And it becomes mm. so important to who you are and how your career progresses, your personal life. And I think people need to give failure more of a, um, you know, a hand because there is great learnings and opportunities that can come from the ups and the downs more so Absolutely. even from the downs you know people yeah. say that over and over again and we often see people in the public eye going through those ups and downs mm. and we forgive them most mm. times now there's yep. you know things that we we won't forgive but mm. i think that we we are open to listening and open to people saying who they are and for us to say okay yeah let's give yep. you a chance and yep. i think that I would much rather be coached by someone like you than by someone who has had an extremely linear career. So the other day, I was talking to someone who was going to be recruited to be a headhunter mm -hmm. for one of the very big global headhunting companies. And this person had a, such a linear career, had never changed companies, have had worked for the same company their entire lives. And I'm thinking... Are you the right person to be a headhunter? And so the analogy goes to you and what you do. I'd much rather have a, a coach, a leadership mm. consultant and coach like you who can mm. really share all your scars and your badges and yeah. help people go through good times and bad times. And we focus yeah. on some of the shitty stuff that has, has happened to you, but you've had mm. a You you are still having an amazing career. Yeah, and that's I, I, that's what inspires hope, right? Like yeah, correct. Have gone through shitty times. Correct. I mean, the opportunities that I've had since the I guess the second sacking, uh, if mm -hmm. we want to be as direct as as that, um, have been phenomenal, and and the growth and and, and everything has been uh, incredible. But I just want to touch on before I go there and and talk about some of the successes. I want to touch on again something you brought up. You know, success versus failure, and there is no doubt as I look back on now my 25th year or 25 years of, of my commercial uh, working life that the majority of my learning has come through failures. And mm. although I've had huge successes since that horrible second sacking, I still have had massive failures and and massive challenges in both personal and profession, my professional life. So it, it's not like, hey, I got it out of the way. I've only had those two issues and it's been smooth sailing. That ain't happened either. I have mm -hmm. had plenty of challenges along the way, but thankfully, I've had some really fantastic successes. I've found passion and purpose in what it is that I'm doing. And that's the most important thing I would say to anyone is, is to, to, to really derive fulfillment beyond a paycheck for what it is that you do. And that doesn't mean you have to do that thing forever. You may change, but passion and purpose plays a really, really key role to fulfillment and to a, to a, you know, a, a life, a life worth living. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that for me, most of my learning has come through failures. If I didn't have the failures that I'd had, I think I'd be quite stifled as a, as a human being in terms of a lot of my learning. And to touch on some of the successes, you know, I worked in a great role as sort of head of talent at, at, at ANZ in the institutional bank, change in CEO and the new CEO was not really about talent leadership and high performing teams. So when I left there and, and joined Talent2, an opportunity came for me to start my own venture called Upskill Learning. Um, and that was helping people navigate this really challenging thing of finding courses and careers to help them upskill or reskill to take them onto a new better, um, improved career path. Um, and that's what we did for them. We took a lot of the, the work and the, the effort and the research out and, and did that for people and helped guide them in the, in the right direction for courses and skills. And again, that ran successfully for a number of years. And then suddenly it dropped off again and the government kept changing lots of issues and we had to keep pivoting, as they say. And I had a relationship breakup at the time and my 
relationship breakup also happened to be my business partner. And whilst we are incredibly amicable, it was a very, very challenging time. So, you know, again, another another time of really needing support um, um, from, from people around me and being able to share and talk about the challenges that I was facing helped me avoid some of the pitfalls that I'd heard earlier By on. By then you were used to it, right? By then I was so like, used to it. I so am used experienced to it. at doing this. So <laughs> used to it, you know, talking about, talking about shitty times. And then, yeah. you know, with, with one of my other close mates forming an, a, a tech startup, Build Labor, which I'm sort of in my third year of and, and sort of the challenges in growing a tech startup in a con- crazy competitive landscape, that's been super challenging, super challenging on our friendship, super challenging on our time, super challenging on our mind, on our well-being, on our financial resources. And it's been a real slog to get the business just to where it's at now, which is we've got a we've got a sort of prototype product. Um, it's in the market. It's slowly being tested. But now, now what the company needs is for me to step aside and focus on what I love doing, which is the business coaching, leadership development, etc., and bring in a you know gung ho tech savvy CEO to grow Build Labor. Build Labor is an amazing amazing business, I think, to solve this um, challenge of blue-collar workers finding work quickly, e- easily, and, and effectively in the construction sector through a through an app that will ping alerts, uh, job alerts, because they're typically a, a very fragmented offline market. Amazing business opportunity, but you know, I'm not a tech startup. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. I'm not a tech CEO. I don't want to be a tech CEO. I've inherited that position to this point, but now it needs someone with the skills and the passion and the talent to grow what we've already um, created into something mm-hmm. magnificent and for me to to get back to the roots of, of what I do and what I do much better and what gives me the fulfillment and the well-being and the mental health that I so desire. That's very common. I think people don't realize that when there's a steep learning curve for for startups, the, the CEO should change accordingly. And, you know, as a founder, you have to be humble enough to step down as you you're doing and it's not yeah. easy <laughs> but no it's well not it's done. not easy and it's and it's not yeah. you know it's and it's not for everyone you know i know some in, yeah. uh, some incredible founders who you know took the idea and are now running you know multi-million dollar organizations and doing so very successfully uh, when i came into this business i kind of went maybe this is something that i really want to give a crack to um it it was mm-hmm. 10 times harder than, 100 times harder than I actually thought it was going to be. And that was with some success. You know, we got into a very elite accelerator program. We got some VC funding from from doing that program. So we, so we had some help and still it's, it's incredibly challenging. But absolutely, it has made me realize, again, how important passion and purpose is, whilst mm-hmm. I think the business of Build Labor is absolutely phenomenal and, and has huge impact potential impact on the construction sector. I know that I am not the right person with the right skills to capably lead this organization to where it needs to go. And thus, yes, I need to find someone who can do that and at the same time focus on what is critically important for me. Sasha, what is important for you in 2022? What are you hoping to Um, achieve this year? Oh, look, it's going to sound very cliche, but but really for me, first and foremost is good health. This global pandemic, whilst for some it might have just been a, a cough and an itchy throat for some days, for others, you know, it was it was debilitating. And whether you were indirectly or directly affected, it's just been horrible. So first and foremost, good health. And you know, I started the year with COVID. I, I had it over New Year's, and and it and it knocked me for six. Thankfully, I had it with very close group of friends and we all hung out together and isolated together and and that made the world of difference. But eight days I was struck down by. So uh, I feel for those who are affected in some way, not just with COVID, with anything um, health related. So good health first and foremost. Second thing for me is this transition. You know, I want to successfully see build labor climb to the next tier in, in in its evolution. That's with someone really, really good leading the organization with the right skills, the right capability and the passion. And also for me in stepping into, you know, back into my leadership coaching, leadership development pathway. That's really exciting for me. Thirdly, 
is getting a couple of holidays in, getting on a plane and actually mm-hmm. leaving the shores of Australia. You know, uh, travel is a really important thing for me. Uh, I love it. It's my sanctuary, like I'm sure it is for a lot of people. We've we've all been denied it, so it's not just on me. But but I'm really looking forward to um to to getting on a plane and 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 doing a little bit of travel, all being well later in the year. This sounds like an amazing plan for 2022. I might, I'm going to steal some of your ideas. I haven't made my my plans yet. I'm going to do them on Australia Day. So I'll, I'll incorporate some of that into my yeah. planning. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, health, health is something that unfortunately is very, you know, largely out of, out of my control. You know, there are certain things that I can control to do with my health, but certain things that are, you know, just unavoidable. And then yeah. when it comes to travel, who knows what our governments decide to do. And... So you can take a leaf out of my my book because mm. Andre and I want to do some travel around Australia with a camper van. Yeah, great idea. So, you know, something yeah. you can think of as well. Well, you've just made, you've just reminded me, I'm actually, I bought a van. And you bought am, a van? <laughs> yeah, I bought a van. And I am actually going to meet with a guy on Thursday who is the the one that I've chosen to do the fit out because similar to you, I want a self-sufficient van that, hey, if they're going to lock up our borders, then I got my van, um, I got my bed, I got all the things that I need. Myself and my my little baby girl, Jada, my little mm-hmm. Kelpie, can, um, can go hit the road and um and travel and and also work from anywhere you know i'm in very exactly. fortunate that yeah. uh, to some to we some degree are. yeah i can work from anywhere so yeah I've that's got the, van. the only prerequisite that's... that i've told andrea you can do the fit out you can decide whatever you, you want as long as i have a place to work from i'm fine mm, yeah it. Yeah, so absolutely. That's the fourth one, the biggest getting my van van done. All right, my friend, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your story with us. I know it's going to make a huge impact in lots of people's lives and I will get lots of feedback as I often do and I'll let you know what people say because this is going to be a big one, this episode, I'm sure. Uh, Awesome. Well, If if it helps one person, that's that's great. Exactly, exactly. Doesn't, you know, it, it just 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 one is is great if it helps yeah. more fantastic but thank yeah. you so much for having me it's always a pleasure to work with you thank i you wish you good health for the rest of 2022 well let's have coffee soon bye an executive career spans many many decades so it's important to understand that at some stage you may encounter a setback or two of course listening to this episode i am hoping that you will be able to understand that setbacks can be an opportunity to discover great things about yourself and that there are amazing opportunities on the other side of failure. So happy that you're here listening to it with me and I hope to see you next time at the next episode. Bye for now.